welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for bearing with us through a little bit of sound issues there. Um, welcome to Fleming College's GIS Open House, pre presented by our GIS specialist graduating class of 2023. Um, my name is Kendra Chalmers. I'm a professor here at Fleming College. Um, and uh, I just wanted to welcome you to our wonderful event today. Um, if any of you have any questions or would like to participate in any way, there should be a little speech bubble um, on your WebEx interface. I think it's in the bottom right hand corner. You can go ahead and click on that if you'd like to type in questions or comments, feel free to do so. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with our GIS program or our GIS collaborative projects, um, these projects run and are completed by students every spring by small groups of our GIS specialists. Um, so they're working to solve real world problems given to us by real world clients. Um, our clients come from many different industries. This year we have about 14 projects to showcase in total. So soon our groups will give you some quick presentations that will last for about five minutes long. Um, the five minute presentations will tell you a little bit about their project and then they will take some questions. Um, after that, our next group will go. So about every 10 minutes, you'll get to hear from a different group. Now, I really want to direct you to this URL on screen here. Hopefully we can all see that okay. Um, this is our open house portal website. So if any projects seem interesting to you or you want to know a little bit more because these presentations are a little short, they're just short and sweet, um, please navigate there because then you can take a look at the project in more detail. Um, by clicking on one of our projects listed on our open house portal, you'll be able to see their project website. You'll just be able to hopefully get a little bit more information about, about the team that way. And some of our teams are sort of um, specially featured for our virtual open house today. So you can actually access a little chat room that they're in. So if you want to chat with the team more, some of them you can actually do that. And you can jump into maybe their own WebEx room and uh, have a little one on one with the team if you'd like. Um, so we highly encourage you to go ahead and do that. Um, feel free to navigate the um, Geo Community website. That is our open house portal now. Um, if you'd like to start exploring projects. Our first presentation is going to start at 11.10 a.m. in about seven minutes from now. Um, so I'm going to be muting myself um, while we wait for that one to get set up. Um, if anyone has any questions, again, you can use the little speech bubble in the bottom corner to type in the chat, um, and I'll provide you a link to an uh, open house portal right into chat to make it a little bit easier to access it if anybody is curious in exploring that. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, presentations should begin soon. Hillary, do you want to unmute yourself and say hi? No. <laughs> Excellent. Looks like we're working, so I'm going to pull open our presentation now. And uh, Hillary, you can see that on your end? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So we are Safari Consulting, and we are here to do two things today. Break the ice and talk about the work we did with the Southern African Wildlife College. So the Southern African Wildlife College has been proudly operating for the past 26 years with the aim of meeting training needs for natural resource management. To that end, they offer a variety of training topics related to conservationism, and they also provide services that are integral to the management of the park system itself. I should also point out that they are uh, located within the uh, boundaries of Kruger National Park, of course, in South Africa. Uh, Amanda will now talk to us a bit about our problem statement. Yeah, so our client has used GIS in the past, but it's been to a very limited capacity. The main problems that we were trying to solve with this project were that the spatial data set was very limited and incomplete. Um, the maps that did exist of the campus were rudimentary, and the, um, the navigation solutions for students did not yet exist. So we created seven deliverables in total to assist with these issues, and we're not going to be able to get into the details of all of them, but we will introduce them to you guys. So now I'll pass it to Hillary to start doing that. So the first thing we did was collected data and we verified all the existing data that the client currently had um, around the campus relating to critical infrastructure, life safety, and other features such as roads, trails, buildings, rooms, and more. 
We then compared the data we collected with the existing data. We removed all the duplicates. We standardized all the data and we organized them into file geodatabases. We, in the end, we created one file geodatabase to hold all the data that can be visible by the general public, such as roads and buildings, and another file geodatabase to hold all the sensitive data, such as life safety equipment, which should only be used by uh, staff at the college. Once all of our data was standardized and organized, we then chose which layers would be static for reference. Um, and we use these layers to create our custom base map. We created a few different versions of the base map depending on the use case and the different needs of the client. Um, and these base maps we used in our web maps and other applications such as our asset management solution, which Adrian will talk about now. Yeah, that's my cue. So in terms of asset management, the operations team was interested in harnessing the power of spatial data. Um, and to that, uh, that would help them, uh, that would support their normal operations and it would also support them in planning for emergency management and business continuity. So to that end, we created a couple different solutions. Uh, both of them heavily leverage RTS online and field maps. In the first solution, um, uh, which is available online and offline, field technicians can now in the field go up and conduct their ins uh, inspections with their phone. They can see all the uh, extinguishers and different piece of equipment. They can go there and do their updates live. In the second solution, we took all the critical infrastructure data that we could find, created a clean, organized um, workspace for it, um, and applied some symbology that was uh, in web maps. So now that can all be accessed in one place, and that can be accessed directly from the field for the field technicians and reference, but they can also uh, create field observations. And those observations will go back to the operations lead, who will review it and determine what the next action items are. And they can also perform QA, QC and update the database as required. The last thing I'll talk about is in terms of navigation solutions, they were looking for uh, customized alphanumeric grid codes that reference existing UTM systems. Uh, so we made a couple of a few different PDFs for this, but we also found a way to export that um, uh, layer as a uh, as a feature that could be brought into projects as desired outside of an actual layout. So, for instance, that can be brought into field maps and used and referenced in field. And so these links are available um, for your viewing. And now I'll hand it over to Amanda to talk about the rest of the navigation. Yeah, so we also made some visitor navigation solutions, and these are intended for visitors and students of the college to navigate around the campus. Um, we made both online and offline solutions with an emphasis on offline solutions because reliable internet access is not a reality in this area. Next, we'll look at story maps. We configured a couple of story maps for the college to just show them a different perspective of using GIS and also just to show them how they can use GIS to promote their business. And finally, we'll briefly look at the instruction packages. We created several instruction packages to help maintain each of the deliverable solutions that we just talked about, and also empower the staff with the knowledge that they would need to create similar solutions in the future. And those are all of our deliverables, so I'll pass it to Hillary to conclude. So thank you, and if you want to chat more, you can join us at our WebEx room, um, which you can see on our website there. And yeah, now we invite any questions. And just so you know, this website should be accessible within the uh, Open House portal. Should I also send the link in the chat? Would that be helpful? Sure. Sure, that'd be a great idea. All right, I'm not seeing any questions coming through. See if there's maybe a separate note. So if there's no questions at maybe 11, 18, we'll, uh, we'll turn off the share screen and uh, prep the next group. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, uh, if you're interested in working more with the Safari Consulting team, I should point out that we also have a team page here and you can access any of our LinkedIn profiles and reach out and say hi if you're not already a uh, member of friends with us on, on Teams.
<laughs> All right, everyone. I think uh, that's it for us. Uh, we will uh, please hold on for the next for the next presenters. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Anupav, and I'm here to speak about like what my project was for the collab. So I am from Group Two Three Zero Two, where we made a uh, web application for the municipality of Clarington. Okay, so here I am, and this is how the app looks like. So here our main goal was to present how the assets, like what assets the Clarington municipality had, and how they could present it or visualize it on a map because everybody looks at the data from a database which is not interactive and when you get the same data on the map it gets more interactive where you can get more details about that asset so that is what we came as an output so to make this as an output we had a lot of things in the pipeline so we started with a new database which had the normalization form because the data ex existing data was in different tables. We bought it into one. We bought all the assets into one to make it a proper working database. So to load that, it was a very big repeating process, and we automated it. Right then, obviously, to visualize it, you need it to be beautiful, and to make it beautiful, you need the cartographic aspect in it. That is how we got the cartographic aspect in it, and then we combined everything on the RTS online experience builder. From where we got a beautiful online map. So I'll show you how the map looks like. So when we go to the link, this is how the map looks like. This is the welcome page where you get to see what it is. So just let me tell you, this map is mainly for the municipal workers right now when they work on an asset so that they can know where they are and what asset is it. And they get to see all the details of that. So for example, I go here on the bridge and I just select the bridge. I get to see what asset ID it is. And when I go here, the bridge here, you get to see what it is, what the name is. So as you can see that this bridge is made by cast in place. What's the CCA rating for the taxation purposes? what location it is, the condition, when it was serviced and everything. So this makes it more easier for people to work and to identify what it is. Now, so that one can make it more interactive, we added a draw tool where I can just draw different features, different lines. I'll be like, okay, we need to plan something from here to here because we have storm drains here. So how can we do that? I, I draw the perf a beautiful drawing on my map. Now to get that as an output, I come here, I set whatever it is, and I get a print of it. If I don't want to do that, I select only the layers. Like I want to see only catch basins in here. All right, how to see catch basins in here? I come, zoom out, and on the map, I'll only see catch basins now because I'm working on catch basins here. So this is what my map output came as finally. and if you see right now, it's only points data, but when you come here, you get to see the sidewalks, the drain lines, where they are laid out, how everything is working. So yeah, this helps the municipal worker there, how to go to the uh, location and look out for the data, wh what asset they are standing next to, and they can get to know all the information regarding that. So I, the website for my team is in the chats. Thank you all. Uh, if any questions, I would like to answer you guys. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this virtual presentation. Uh, we are Fleming students of GIS. The topic of our presentation is evaluation of water set hydrology and land use in Kater Golden Horse Zoo. Uh, we're talking about the background of this project. Uh, why we are doing this project is because uh, Ontario is on, Ontario is having an ongoing rapid urbanization and it's having an impact on the environment. Our client, Ontario Head, Headwater Institute, is working to protect the water and streams in the in that area. Uh, so we uh, we came up with a website that displays where are the uh, where are the watershed boundaries and then the stream order in that area. 
uh, for this is our total solution. You can see the web page over here. And we have done special analysis uh, using ArcGIS Pro's Arc Hydro Toolbox uh, to delineate the water set boundary. And then we have created the stream order that are in that area. And this is the home page. If you go to the methodology page, you can see how we have collected the data. It's all over here. Uh, about, this is about extract, data extraction and preprocessing. We have acquired our data from Ontario Geohub, which is Living Atlas and NavTech. And this is the workflow for spatial analysis. That's the model that we have used. And all the necessary methodology used in this project is over in this space. You can have a look over here. Talking about our solution is over here. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rajiv. So here's our solution page. As you can see, it is a web map. We created this map in Mapbox. So just let me turn on some layers here so you can see. So for example, we have one to five stream orders. You can turn on some of them or off some of them, like depending on which order you are interested. And we also have a, like a catchment boundary here, which is the watershed boundary. We also have multiple legends here telling you what this color represent and for what is like for the color choice which we will discuss this momentarily but for now we can we can you can you can also play with our website we can um we just sending the website link to the chatting room so you can play with it and uh it is fully compatible with the uh mobile device so you can just let me check it uh yeah, it's fully responsive and you can open it on any mobile device. And we also have a satellite image background based on the client's request. And so you can talk about the visualization part. Thank you, May. So for the visualization, we have used this uh, two types of base map. One was a monochrome base map and the second was a satellite street base map. So for the monochrome base map, we have used this uh, color palette so that um, it can, uh, so that um, it can, uh, so to improve the clarity and the legibility of the study area, um, you can see this uh, the stream orders, the color are used all different shades of blue and uh, of different width. We have to uh, clip the study, um, sorry, the stream orders outside the study area for the better um, results. We have also given the catchment area in different uh, catchment um, boundaries to show um, what is the origin? And um, I think for better, uh, for more reference, if you want to see, you can check our link. And if you have any other questions, we are here to assist you. There's our team in the world space. And our rules have been explained in space. So here. And all the related sites about the phases are over here, Chemics JS program and other projects, the previous year's projects. And here's the link to our clients on social media. You can check it out as well. Thank you very much. That's all from our side. If you have any questions, feel free, feel free to ask. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Alex, and my fellow presenters today are Nem and Bharat. And we'll be presenting on the building footprint extractions from aerial imagery for the County of Brant. So the County of Brant is a single tier municipality in southwestern Ontario, and it has a strong dedicated GIS department focused on capturing aerial imagery. So they do this one of two ways. They um, capture aerial imagery with their own drone, as well as capturing countywide imagery with annual airplane flights. So these images are then stitched together in something called an ortho mosaic. And uh, these ortho mosaic is then divided up into one kilometer square tiles, of which we've decided to focus on two, Paris North and Paris South, which are central to the county and heavily urbanized. Uh, so the county is looking to primarily eliminate the use for digitization, um, which can reduce costs and uh, labor costs as well as we have looked into combining um, zoning permits as well as change detection. On to the project solution now. As the 
initial imagery we had was of high resolution, we had to resample the imagery in order to make it work for the model. So the team came up with uh, resample the images to three different sizes, that is 10, 20, and 40 centimeter each. And now each of these resample images had some pros and cons. Like for this in here, as you can see, this is image resemble at 10 centimeter resolution. And it can detect small objects, but it does it does make a mistake detecting big, big, big building footprints. And on the other scenario, if we use 40 centimeter res resolution, it's it's pretty good at picking up big objects, but it does miss small, small sheds or small building footprints. Uh, finally, we did run the model on 20 centimeter resolution, resample imagery, and the result we got was pretty good. It was it was actually best till so far and that's why we went ahead with the 20 centimeter resolution so regarding the accuracy of our classification since one of our main use cases to reduce the need for digitization we took the original digitized building footprints that the county of grant compiled just by manually digitizing every building in the image and then we took our building footprints that we obtained through our classification process and we did a spatial join to see how many of our buildings line up with the buildings that they captured through their manual digitization. And we were able to uh, find that our classification process actually captured roughly around 70% of all the buildings in the image. And that effectively would mean that that would reduce a person's time spent on digitization by 70%. And so you can see in the image below that the yellow buildings are the buildings that were originally digitized by hand and the green buildings were the buildings that we classified. So even after our classification, the GIS user will still have to manually edit some aspects of the, the building footprints that were made. So our earlier methodology went about um, a few different ways. Um, the imagery that we have uh, compared to um, something you would regularly classify using remote sensing techniques. Um, those you can use building indexes, but require more bands than we had access to. So the imagery is just red, blue, green, um, which is why we went the pathway of using AI tools um, through multiple different uh, softwares and a few different techniques within the ESRI environment. Finally, the team hold on to deep learning packages because that gave us the best result. And although the already pre-existing DLPK get us the best result, we we went on ahead and created script to refine or retune the model to fit our geographic area. That's our client's area. In a sense, that model can generate more accurate result. So with our resampled images and the newly fine-tuned deep learning package that we trained, we were able to create a model using Model Builder and ArcGIS Pro using the deep learning package, the image as parameters, as well as processor type. As processing, it takes a lot of time depending on the computer specs they're using it on. And this is in tandem with using detect objects using deep learning and regularized buildings in which that makes the final product more cartographically uh, pliable. And Besides using the detect learning of deep objects, we actually tried using the geo AI tools as well, but we found that we couldn't streamline a model using model builder using geo AI. So we settled with having to use the detect objects using deep learning. And then lastly, with our final building output that we've got, and you can see on the image on the left, we took zoning data that we found from the county of Brands and then created a spatial joint to see which of our classified buildings fall under certain so zoning bylaws. And then as a result, if there are new buildings that were made from new images that are created year after year and you were able to capture them along with the spatial join, then you could see which buildings actually violate permitting. And so our final remarks, uh, we'd like to thank you guys for taking part in our presentation. Um, we look forward to meeting with everybody in our booth. And uh, if you would like to contact us, you can see our information up on the website. We'd yeah. like to open up the floor for any questions. If you have any, uh, we'll be hanging around for a little bit. Yeah. So we have a question in the chat here. Do you foresee any challenges in scaling this up to an entire countywide area? Yeah, so I would say that one of the biggest challenges would be the the more images, the larger the images and the more images that you have, the more processing that's required. We were uh, originally going to use the ortho mosaic and then considering the amount of processing power that was needed, we decided to just take 
those the Paris North, Paris South, one kilometer tile images because they're more manageable. Although you're able to scale it up depending on what uh, computer specs you have. And then Brad, I think we talked about how you can actually have uh, access to multiple GPUs as one out, out, on once by using ArcGIS Enterprise. And so, um, and then this also comes, this also depends on the type of GPU that you have as well. The better the graphics card, the the lower the time that is necessary to have to do the classification. Yeah, in the end, it, it just comes down to the cost. And if if the enterprise makes sense, uh, like if the area is too large, then enterprise does make sense, but then that does push up the cost a bit as well. Uh, but for a small county, it should be manageable through ArcGIS Pro, although it will take time, hours, but that should be manageable without enterprise tool. So yeah. the cost figure is always there. Yeah, depending on the county size and how much imagery you're processing, uh, we have streamlined this um, within code and within model builder to automate the process. Um, but if you're looking at processing time, um, which can be supplemented by cost of like um, additional GPUs. Um, but it it does depend on, I guess, like how much imagery you're really looking to process. So it can depend, but it is very much possible. And the model we have could do it. Um, it just depends on your specs and what you're looking, how much you're looking to process. Any other questions? We can also go back. I, uh, I don't see anyone putting up uh, stuff on the chat. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, seeing our presentation. And yeah, like Alex said, we're open up at the booth. If any of you have any more questions that you want to see about how we actually uh, constructed this entire workflow. So hopefully we'll see you all there. Uh, if yes. not, have a good day. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Will, and my fellow groupmates are Grace and Esther. We're excited to bring to you today our open data portal for the County of Brant. So uh, to start, we'll go over briefly what open data is and then discuss some of our results that we've come to see along the way. Um, first of all, what is open data? Uh, open data's main focus is to really share information to the public in an engaging way to provide awareness and education to the general public. Um, it allows for greater engagement with the community, uh, making the data as transparent as possible. Um, and that was kind of our main focus uh, when creating our results. Uh, other factors that we consider during our development are things such as data quality, public engagement, and accessibility. Um, as a result, with our open data portal, um, it uses the, uh, the most essential and the most usable data for all users. Um, now we're excited to share with you uh, some of the results. Welcome to our open data portal. It's powered by ArcGIS Hub. As a user of our hub, you'll be greeted with this on your main page. As you can see, there is a search the catalog option at the very top of the page, as well as eight different categories that you can explore. So let's say you're a user who's very interested in the beautiful trails of County of Brant. You can click on the Parks and Recreation category, and this will take you to the data catalog for that category. So once you click on the trails data set, you will be taken to the data view. And at this point, you could zoom in and out of the base map, or you could click on one of the pulley lines in order to open up a pop-up. And you can also view the data table right over here if you'd like to view all of the records at once. And you can also download the data so that you can use it for your own uh, good later on. So after you clicked on all of the data, viewed it, analyzed it, downloaded it, maybe you'd like to go back to the main page where you'd like to see some of the applications that we made. And these are the applications here that were made with ArcGIS online products. So we have our story map, the data of the week using the gallery, as well as the experience builder. So all of these products were made using the data that we got from County of Brant. And these are here for your own experience to improve the experience that you have on our hub and also to browse some of the data that maybe you may find interesting. So let's say that the story map caught your eye. 
you can either view the story map right on the main page, or you could actually go into the header that says Spotlight, and you can view the story map to its full extent. The story map has uh, the heritage information that County of Brand has given to us, and uh, you could view it through the, using the timeline widget or the sidecar, which has the web map with the custom uh, base map as well as symbology. Or you could also view more information in, uh, through the image gallery as well. I hope you enjoyed a look into our portal and survey, I mean, story map. Uh, in conclusion, our group found that ArcGIS Hub was an effective tool to create an open data portal. Uh, although one of our limitations was the fact that an ArcGIS Hub open data portal tends to look like it was made from ArcGIS Hub, it was important to keep in mind that the research and existing examples contain the same components because they work effectively and that can lead to a similar looking design. An example of such component would be the feedback survey that we had created using survey one, two, three. Uh, not only does this increase the engagement of users, it also becomes a tool to improve the platform in more purposeful ways into the future. If you're interested in this project, feel free to join us in our WebEx meeting or look through our web page. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions if there are any. Yeah, if there are any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. All right, I guess not. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. We hope that the um, hub will be up soon for, um, from the side of County of Brand and that you can see all of the data that they have to offer. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen Van Dam. I'm here with you and Harris. And our project was streamlining GIS processes for Cambium Incorporated. And the first deliverable, if the project took the form, sorry, of two deliverables. The first was uh, updating, or what we ended up doing was replacing a well water database for Cambium Incorporated. They connect to the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation, and Parks to collect well water data for projects. They have a site specific site, they need the information around it. Um, but you can see in this figure here that uh, there's a lot of wells. It turns out to be just under 900,000 at the moment and still going. You can see in this map, uh, when we're zoomed into Kingston here, uh, they're just everywhere. And sorting through all of that data at once is not realistic. So we work with them on their process and they select a site, which is their area of interest. And we wrote a script to automate creating a buffer around and selecting wells from the ministry database specific to their job site. Uh, and then we took those scripts further because the incoming data is really mashed together. Um, you can see from this image, it's pretty much unreadable and they need to be able to put it out into a report. So we use some Python scripts to normalize the data, break it out of the mishmash and separate it into what ended up being three separate tables with data that's open, clear, and easy to read. Uh, and then we were able to use that script to output it into a couple of different tables. Uh, as well as a final report that they could use in appendices for their figures. And then I'm going to turn it over to Ewan to talk about our second deliverable. Thank you, Stephen. So this was the other portion of our project, which was um, effectively trying to better manage or create better access for aerial imagery uh, within the Cambian organization. So we developed a, a little app here in Leaflet that essentially will allow you to identify certain sites through these polygons where they have imagery available. And that then allows them to um, identify their site in a particular region. And they can then approximately draw their site in an area of where some images are. 
and then we can find the aerial imagery. So there's one particular image there that you showed just showed up that has the entire site sort of covered. Um, so that is why that image comes up. So there was some specific coding that looked after that. Um, and then the actual information about the um, image and the actual location of those images, the georeference um, TIFFs um, is stored in uh, GeoJSON. So all of that information then allows us to draw the um, images from a directory. Um, but before that, we um, also established a process to convert the uh, GeoTIFFs to cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs. So that creates a sort of um, image that's tiled and is more efficient in terms of storage and retrieval. And uh, we created a little um, batch file that basically converted that. Um, and we also overcame a little bit of a projection problem, which um, was making sure that they are converted into um, Web Mercator. So that's uh, 3857 is the SRID. And then um, allowing each image to carry that through, which means that then they can be easily rendered on the um, map. So that's um, the key kind of pieces of um, deliverable too. And then that can be shared through the organization and different groups can identify sites through the imagery and send it to their drafting team. So that's in a nutshell, deliverable two. Um, and I can now conclude that full portion of our presentation. Any questions from anyone? All right. I think there are any questions. Okay. How how does the well portion of the app stay updated with the MOE's data set? Great question. The uh, the it's actually the MECP uh, maintains a hosted feature layer that can be accessed through a REST endpoint. And so, since our client uses ArcGIS Pro, uh, we were just able to set up a server connection. Um, and we confirmed with the MECP they do update that data set quarterly as well as the other data sets available for download on their website. So uh, it maintains itself up to date. Thank you for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the presentations. Yes, thanks everyone. Hello everyone, my name is Jordan Tischler and, and we are the Backstreet Boys and we will be uh, presenting our phase two who, uh, community connection product uh, project with the Bastard Creek Watershed Alliance. Um, this is our story map uh, of, of, uh, uh, for our project. It just shows all our deliverables. And starting off, uh, Baxter Creek the Watershed Alliance was founded in 2021. And, and uh, in 2022, they had uh, phase one, which created a lot of foundational inform information with Fleming College. And now we are continuing that with phase two, updating all the foundational information and, and much more. And then in 2024, they will be conducting phase three as well. Uh, this is a little bit about, about the historic <laughs> history of, of, of Millbrook, which is where Air Baxter Creek is, is, is located. Uh, uh, this just goes, goes through any of the history the, um, that is associated with it, it, just showing how it's evolved throughout the years. And now I will hand it off to Sam for a little bit about the story map. Uh, yeah, so the story map is one of our main deliverables, and the main objective of the Bachelor Creek Watershed Alliance is to use GIS to engage the public in watershed conservation efforts um, in like a very local way. So all of our deliverables are related to that, and our, one of our main means of explaining the public um, the GIS to the public is through the story map. And I'll hand it right back to Jordan. All right, so the Amphibian Monitoring Program was one of our deliverables. The main goal of this one was to take a, the BCWA's original paper forum and make it into a survey one, two, three. Uh, the goal with this, this forum is to uh, go, go to watersheds and check their health by, by um, testing their uh, amphibian health in the area. Um, so what this does when, when, when somebody submits a survey, uh, it goes to a administration dashboard and then it, and then from there, 
uh, the client can then review it to make sure everything's good, and then it will go. Uh, and if it is, it will go to the public dashboard, which is seen here uh, on on our story map. And then I will hand it off to Chris for our Community Connections Watershed Watch. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, so for our Watershed Watch application, again, it's a it's a mobile mobile application used um, like as a survey. So anyone from the public or from the Baxter Creek can go to the, uh, the Baxter Creek and just take a picture, like a quick capture of um, certain attributes that would be interesting, such as like a rare plant or some erosion. And then this uh, gets sent to another uh, dashboard similar to the uh, amphibian one where it gets reviewed, all the pictures get reviewed and then accepted, which then put it to a public facing uh, dashboard. So you can actually see the pictures that you take. And this just helps for general visualization of the watershed. And for uh, the map series, we'll have Sam. So yeah, another one of our main ways that we tend to reach the public is through the development of this map series, which serves as an accessible educational resource for anyone in the public interested in getting involved. They're downloadable in a PDF format on the Metro Watershed Hub, which you should be sure to check out if you're interested in knowing more. Um, it includes this reference map, super canopy map, superficial geology map, and a print form of this indigenous engagement map. And so <clears throat> this map is also exists in another form, but the main objective is to highlight the reserves within Treaty 20 with rights to the Trent waterways, which is where Melbourne Beat is located in the DCWA. And so our client is very interested in working with them because they have unique rights and perspectives to the waters that uh, they're you know, interested in conserving. It also exists in this web map format, which um, does not highlight these tribes in particular since we do not exclude any other uh, First Nations people. I will head back to Chris to talk about our watershed characterization dashboard. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, so for our watershed characterization dashboard, this was a, a larger deliverable that we uh, created. Um, this is for, it is public facing, but it's for uh, people who have a little bit of knowledge about watersheds. And it just gives in-depth information about the watershed, such as flows, elevations, and all this information uh, is basically an overview of what's kind of happening um, with the watershed. And it's it also is linked to a lot of graphs and charts, so you can see the information. And for our conclusion, it's Jordan. And in conclusion, um, um, we uh, completed all the primary deliverables, which we have showcased case mostly in this story map. Um, and, the, and then we also completed all the secondary deliverables, which uh, kind of add on to our, our primary deliverables and uh, can be showed, can, can be seen in, in our um, in our website that is on on the uh, Fleming G GIS Open House website. Uh, if you if you want to see anything else outside, I I feel, can feel free to use that. Um, sorry, what was that question? Yeah. Uh, but that is basically where does the flow data come from? Oh, that's. Uh, oh yeah. So we get most of the data off of uh, the on Ontario uh, Watershed Information Tool. It's uh, called OWIT, and it just you can create watersheds on it, and it gives it calculates a lot of the data, and we pull it off in a table, and then connect the table to the to the uh, the watershed characterization dashboard. Uh, was there any other questions uh, about our project? Feel free. Uh, but yeah, uh, BCWA plans to do a phase three with a digital twin and a 3D map, but that's about it for us. Awesome. If there's any other questions, um, you can also check out our website on the Fleming Geo community yep. for more information on any of our deliverables. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. <laughs> that. All right. So, the Cardon Alvar, the remote sensing analysis of woody species succession, the Cardon Alvar. So, we use plant sound imagery. 
um, for woody species succession was assessed and displayed in an interactive web map, the web map to indicate uh, priority areas for restoration efforts. So the Cardon Alvar so is an excellent alvar of multiple types of alvar communities, including pavement alvars, different alvars um, which are being threatened by woody species. The shift in alvar composition proved to be detrimental for many unique and possibly threatened or endangered species thriving in the pavement alvars. Our team has been working with the Nature Conservancy of Canada um, to assess the loss of pavement alvars in the Cardon Alvar natural area. To do this, we analyzed Landsat imagery using remote sensing techniques and created a dashboard to display the results. So to briefly go over the methods to get to our final, to solution, to our final solution, we needed to build the geodatabase. The geodatabase. Uh, this contains the boundaries, ecological, boundaries, and, ecological classification, and classification, uh, species data, which was queried to find which ones were at risk. Which and then we needed to classify imagery that was collected from that was collected years, from 1972 to 2022. 20, and the classes used to classify were emergent vegetation, wetland, water, coniferous, deciduous bare ground uh, and industrial, and then compute change was then done to see the changes in landscape composition through time. Uh, and then our static map was to help visualize the changes in Alvar over time. And then a uh, chart surround was included to show the trends of the Alvar uh, land cover for every classified year. And then finally, we made a web map with all the desire, desired layers that could then be used for the AGOL, a, a ArcGIS Online dashboard, which will now be talked about. The overall goal for the dashboard was to help with restoration and conservation decision making processes by allowing the users to interact with the data. Some of the features in the dashboard include two charts that are at the bottom. And they're both interactive, so they'll adjust what's shown based on the zoom extent of the map. For the Alvar one, which is on the left, uh, you can click on the bars and it will display the total Alvar cover for that area, allowing viewers just to see really how the Alvar has changed over time. There's other interactive features that we've included, such as a species list, um, the chart that shows the species at risk and total observation counts on the properties. And to see more of that, if you wanted to stop by our poster presentation or join our WebEx room, we have a link on the Geo Community site. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, the losses and gains are the total Alvar that was gained and the total Alvar that was lost between each set of classifications for each year. If anyone does come up with any other questions, they can just visit our WebEx room for the group. And I think that's close to our time, but we'll stick around for a bit longer. Okay, I will be in person if anyone wants to come to there to ask any questions regarding the dashboard or the website. Thank you. Alrighty, so we are LYB Consulting and we are excited to be here with you today. Um, the team consists of myself, Becca Carmichael, um, Lucia and YJ, and we're going to break down and talk to you about our project, the Immersive Insights into Nature Environmental Monitoring Dashboards for Quartha Conservation Project. So a little bit of a background on our project. Quartha Conservation is located in Ontario um, and a part of doing their duty to ensure the ongoing uh, health of the watershed, they developed a 10 year environmental monitoring strategy, which included many recommendations, some of which centered around data reporting and sharing to encourage public interaction and understanding of the vital information they collect throughout the watershed. Uh, to achieve these recommendations, they partnered with LYB Consulting to develop this project. Our team has worked to develop several resources for Quartha Conservation that they can use to achieve these data sharing recommendations. Um, and they'll 
be for three of their environmental programs, so biomonitoring, water temperature monitoring, and water quality monitoring. We have created individual dashboards for each program, as well as a story map housing those dashboards, um, which Kawartha Conservation will then add to their public-facing website, which will allow the public to interact with the data and observe the findings for each environmental program in a very immersive way. During the creation of this project, our team also ensured the data could be updated frequently by our client through an automated process in order to effectively keep the data up to date. So now we're going to explore our final deliverables. Uh, the first deliverable was our story map, which acts as the housing point for all of our other um, information. It features our, data board, or our dashboards integrated into the pro final product, um, as well as background information about uh, Kawartha Conservation, the Integrated Watershed Management Department, and their 10-year review. Um, so now we'll, I'll pass it off to YJ, and she'll break down the first dashboard. Thank you. Um, the first dashboard is the biomonitoring dashboard. Um, Becca, could you select a site? So the dashboard allows the user to select a site and then view its site photo and site details on the two sides of the map. A user can also see the percentage of sensitive organism of that site and show on the left graph whether it's above or below the average, and as well as assess the water quality through the family biotic index, which indicates whether the water quality is excellent or good or poor. Also, users have um, the option to filter the sites based on the uh, habitat type, site type, and year, which enables them to visualize the data in various ways. Um, the second dashboard is the temperature monitoring dashboard. Select site. So it displays the collected water temperature data from sample sites across the Kawartha watershed, and it includes a bar graph showing the percentage of days in each month where the water temperature falls below the favorable temperature for brook trout habitat, which is uh, 22 degrees Celsius. And I'll pass to Lucia for the next. So our third and uh, final dashboard is the water quality dashboard. So this dashboard displays the concentration of categories such as, uh, for example, chloride, phosphorus, and dissolved oxygen. Uh, within the Kawartha Lakes watershed. Um, to use the dashboard, you simply click on the drop down menus on the top right to filter through the categories, uh, select a year, and select a station on the map. So here you can see two line graphs one for monthly concentration um, for the selected category and one for the either yearly concentration. Uh, you also have a bar graph on the bottom that shows the percentage of samples they, that uh, pass the threshold values. Uh, for the selected year and category. Um, in this example, you can see that a few of the stations had samples that fell below the threshold for dissolved oxygen or for uh, nitrate, uh, which are shown in red. And then to get all these dashboards up and running, it was uh, necessary to create a script that automates the data processing in addition to uploading the process data to ArcGIS Online. Uh, data processing involves applying domains and attribute rules as, as well as populating new fields using the calculate field tool in ArcPy. And then after processing the data, the script then displays the data on the map and a service definition file is created. Uh, this file stores all the necessary feature layer data, such as the layers attribute table and symbology. And then finally, the service definition is uploaded to ArcGIS Online. So that concludes our presentation. If you'd like to know more, please feel free, feel free to visit our website uh, now we will open the floor for any questions. So I see a question here. Um, I think we, yeah, we did um, receive a uh, few data platforms uh, as inspiration for our story map. Um, if there's no other questions, feel free to join our WebEx meeting, which can be found on the GEO community website. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Welcome everyone. I'm Kazana. And I'm here with my team members, Janet and Ashley. Today, we are excited to present our collaborative project to you. 
uh, introducing our solution, headwater identification for land conservation, land conservation in the Kingston area, an interactive online map viewer. Uh, okay, let's dive into the details. We are the team of GIS application special students uh, at Florian College, known as Jupiter GIS. Our project's primary goal is to provide accurate information uh, to our client that will enable our client to make informed decisions. The client for this project uh, is the land conservancy for Kingston, Fontana, and Ad Fontana Glenis, and Addington. The conservancy is committed to uh, protective, uh, protective core areas within their area of interest to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Over to you, Ashley. The area of interest is shown on the map to the right of the slide. The purpose of this collaborative project was to provide a solution that will aid in the decision making process in land acquisition assessments for land conservation. The deliverables for this project are an updated and accurate watershed analysis and a map viewer that allows conservancy members to view potential properties and areas of high ecological importance for preservation within the area of interest. Prior to the watershed analysis phase, all data sets were approximately, or sorry, appropriately projected to obtain accurate results and were then clipped to the extent of the area of interest to improve efficiency by creating a new geographic subset of features that were within the boundary of the area of interest. Attribute tables for necessary data sets were then updated with added fields and populated with their respective attributions to retain useful information prior to merging. The separate conservancy data sets were merged to create singular layers, and the separate Ontario integrated hydrology data sets were merged to create singular enforced DEM and enhanced flow direction layers. This final processing step was important for the efficiency and organization of the collective data for the analysis phase. The results is a new and, impro new and improved data set from the pre-processing stage that will provide the conservancy with a mass uniform data set that facilitates accuracy and efficiency to confidently make informed decisions regarding conservation through future analyses. And now over to Janet with our watershed analysis. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about our first main deliverable, the watershed analysis. There are two main outputs in this analysis, a watershed data set and a headwater data set. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those two deliverables and why they're important for conservation. A watershed is an area where all water flows uh, to a single core point, like a river or a lake. This image shows a watershed where the height of land is delineated by that red dotted line. The blue arrows show water flow in opposite directions down either side of that ridge where water flow within the watershed accumulates into larger streams until it reaches Howie Sound on the right side of the image. Understanding watersheds is important for conservation because they are essential for the management of water resources and ecosystems. Headwaters refer to the source or beginning of a hydrological system and are found at the height of land within a watershed. These areas often consist of springs, small creeks, or swamps. In this image, we see a watershed with headwaters being noted at the left side of the image. Here we see the height of land as mountains where rainfall is accumulating and running down the hill, gathering into larger stream segments until it ultimately reaches the sea. Headwaters are ecologically significant for many reasons, including water quality, biodiversity, and water flow. So let's talk about how we did it. For this analysis, we used ArcGIS Pro 3.0 and the Arc Hydro toolset. Arc Hydro takes the DEM and runs it through a series of tools where the output of one tool is the input of the next. Through this process, we were able to create the required output of a quaternary watershed data set and a headwater data set. So results for our watershed. Here is our results from the watershed analysis. There are 240 catchments uh, with a mean area of 15 square kilometers within our client's area of interest. And here are the results from our headwater areas. 
uh, there's a total of 49 catchments, which represents about 34% of the total area of interest for our client. Over to you, Kazana. Thanks, Janet. The development process for the viewer had different stages, which included data preparation, web map development, web application development, and layout and design. Data preparation typically included tasks such as deploying required layers to web environment, implementing access restrictions to ensure privacy. In the web map development phase, defining scale dependencies, cartographic visualization, symbolizing layers, and configuring attribute querying through pop-ups were implemented. Finally, during the web application development phase, widgets were configured to enhance functionality and layout and design elements were customized. This is a result of the web application that not only highlights uh, cartographic design symbology and scale dependency for specific layers, but also provides intuitive tools and functionalities for data exploration. The widgets enhance the functionality and user experience, allowing the conservancy to assess properties based on their ecological values and make informed decisions to preserve those areas effectively. Over to you, Janet. So in conclusion, it was our pleasure to work with the Land Conservancy and a fantastic learning experience. We, are, we feel privileged uh, to have been able to support conservation in this way, and we are very thankful to our school, professors, and coordinators who have made this all possible. Thank you very much. I think we're good. You guys can see the slides? Yep. Yes. We're good. Okay. Good afternoon. We are Canopy Core Solutions, and we're here to tell you about our collaborative project, Strategies to Grow Peterborough's Urban Forest. Our main goal for this project was to determine if the city's canopy cover target 35% by 2051 is truly achievable. We also wanted to provide them with tools as they embark on increasing their canopy cover so they can accurately monitor their progress and communicate their mission with various stakeholders, whether at the municipal level or in the private sector. Much like the forest itself, our project was multifaceted and consisted of numerous layers that interacted with and built on each other. We developed methodologies to estimate current existing canopy cover, as well as to determine where new trees could be planted or potential planting areas. And both layers laid the foundation for performing the multi-criteria decision and statistical analysis um, combined together all these elements fueled the web application and cartographic projects that emerge at the top. I'll now hand it over to Kevin to talk more about estimating the canopy cover. Thanks, Abby. Okay, so we needed to deliver precise and trustworthy data to our clients and help them with decision making. So we needed to uh, come up with a reliable estimate of the existing canopy. Uh, and this served as the backbone for producing the rest of our uh, results and deliverables. So we used LiDAR data and we focused on tree canopy 5 meters or above. And this helped us to differentiate between shrubs and trees. From the LiDAR data, we extracted a canopy height model and this was fine tuned using focal statistics. Resulting in a realistic and per, uh, precise polygon output. Reliability was confirmed through cross validation with high resolution aerial imagery. And the uh, aerial imagery was flown seven days apart, so it acted as a uh, reliable visual reference and used to uh, quality control all our outputs. Finally, we incorporated existing tree inventory data, which was point data, and this en enhanced the final canopy estimate. So we did this to um, pick up smaller trees that could have been planted recently and also would have been missed by our, our high veg lighter data. So, how do we consider, or why do we consider this to be a reliable estimate? Well, if you look at image A, you can see the right side of the road, you can see the result of us incorporating tree inventory point data. And these would be, this is an example of trees that are less than five meters in height, but we wanted to obviously measure that and incorporate that. The image on the right, uh, we can see the white transparent canopy cover polygon. On top of that, you see yellow points. And these points are the LIDAR uh, uh, high veg points. And you can see that our polygon output does a pretty good job representing the canopy spread without overestimating. And I'm going to pass it on now to Anand. He's going to talk about potential planting areas. 
sorry, I'm the one that's the. Sorry, Sunia, I'm sorry. <laughs> the role. Um, so we need to find the areas where they, the plants could plant trees, and that's what we mean by potential planting areas. Um, the minimum area that was required was a grid of three to five meters, so it's 15 meters square in total. And we had to explode areas according to obviously very zoning criteria on where to plant trees. And this is why we did exclusions and buffers. Um, moving on to the next slide. So this is an example of what our potential planting area is. As you can see, the small squares are three to five meters square each. Um, next slide. I'm moving on to Anand. So uh, with all the data, we had to incorporate them into the web products. So we have three main components for that. We built an experience builder application. We had a dashboard and field maps. So uh, we'll be showing some screenshots of the experience builder. The experience builder incorporate everything which we have done, including all the maps and field maps. So this is how the experience builder home screen looks, and this is how the uh, priority planning areas and the maps, which, are, which were derived as part of the study. Up. And moving on, this one is the field maps app. The field maps app updates automatically with the database containing the tree information. So when we when the city adds trees, it gets updated. Or when the tree when the city removes trees, it also gets updated. And this is a good tool for the workers on field to get data. This is the dashboard. This dashboard also updates as per the field maps. So any data collector, any data removed get automatically put on. So I'll be moving to Kevin for talking about our cartographic product. Thanks, Anand. Okay, so for uh, cartography, we built a static wall map and also the web maps that are incorporated into the experience builder. And let's see an example here. Okay, so the wall map, we started off with the greatest scale base map. We have inset map. Um, we have a background map to help kind of bring everything together and make it visually appealing. Followed cartographic principles. The web map, web map uh, gallery here just shows screenshots of uh, some of the uh, interactive web maps that we made that are shown in our experience builder, which you will be able to see after this presentation. And then finally, we made a nice infographic here, which shows some of the statistical analysis we did. And you can also see this in our booth and when you interact with us live at our, uh, online in our WebEx. And that's about it. We're going to uh, say thanks and you can join us again here in our WebEx room for more questions and get more information. All right. I guess uh, I think that is yes. All right. Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. Today we're going to present our project about um, integrating deep learning and LiDAR for flood planning. Uh, in Coburg. So the team, um, I'm Vince Ortona, we have Francis here and uh, Jose. Um, we're all in the application specialist program here at Columbia College. So uh, just an introduction, uh, our client Sustainable Coburg, they're a non-governmental organization. Uh, and then we have the Ganaras Region Conservation Authority helping out as well and uh, the town of Coburg. We're not sharing our screen. <laughs> oh. For some reason, we think that I tried to have a presentation. We wanted to be able to. Oh, yeah. So did you flip it? The page. <laughs> it just crashed. Oh, no. It's uh, not responding. Okay. <laughs> it was Raul that told me. So. Okay. Oh, that's back. Okay. So you do this, right? Screen one. Try just PowerPoint or screen one. Just do screen, screen one. Screen one. Just... Okay. Oh, that's better. All right. So sorry for the. Let's restart. The technical issues, everyone. I think we're good here. <laughs> yeah. All we'll right. Restart. Oh. We'll go. All right. right. Really fast. So very quickly, um, so we're presenting our project about integrating deep learning and lidar for flood planning in Coburg. Uh, the team here, we have me, Vince, Francis, and Jose, um, all in the application specialist program at uh, Columbia College. Um, so who's our client? It's Sustainable Coburg, um, non-governmental uh, organization um, for sustainable practices in Coburg, uh, Ganaras Region Conservation Authority, and uh, the town of Coburg. So 
what are we looking to do? Um, we're looking for solutions to mitigate climate change, um, particularly flooding, because it's a region that's very susceptible for flooding. Um, so we're looking at feasibility of green water infrastructure. So examples of green water infrastructure are uh, rain gardens and bioswales, which retain uh, water naturally um, during uh, flood events. So for the first deliverable of this project, we looked at classifying point clouds for visualization purposes. Um, the original data that we had only had uh, brown points and non-brown points classified. And this is where we ended up using deep learning to um, classify tree cover in, for the study area that we had. And here you can see on the left is the aerial imagery for an area in the study area. And the middle is the feature class that we use for visualization purposes. And we have the right here, which is the classified last point cloud for tree. Yeah, so another input we needed for analysis was um, the, the flow accumulation, so where water is flowing. So to do that, we created a hydrological condition DM, which is just if you have a regular DM, let's say you have a bridge and a stream passing underneath, um, that water passing underneath is not represented in the DM because you only have the surface of the bridge. So hydrologically conditioning, you're lowering the elevation at certain points so that the water can flow more accurately. So that's what we did. Um, this is just our workflow really quickly. You can see on the left in the purple, that's where water is accumulating in the DEM. Um, because if you look on the right, we had to digitize that culvert, which is lowering the elevation of the DEM, and then water is passing more passing through. And then we get a hydrologically accurate model, which we can use for analysis. So, so now we are in the part of suitability analysis. So in order to reduce the impact of the flood event, events in the city of Tau, in the town of Kabok, uh, we conducted a comprehensive study to find the potential sites uh, to install the green water infrastructure. So under the broader claim of green water infrastructure, uh, we come up with two main infrastructure, which are the clay gardens and the biosales. So we developed the methodology uh, to find the potential sites. We got the data from different sources. And we uh, just the ASP rating, which is from one to nine, which is a decision-making technique, which uh, assigns ways to different layers. And yeah, uh, we got some results. And as you can see that, the uh, suitable sites for installing the rain gardens are within the urban fabric. And as we go further from the city, uh, the site, the areas are becoming more suitable. Uh, and this is for the rain gardens. And yeah, as you can see, uh, it's much for, much inside in the city from urban fabric. And this is the results for the NCDA for the biosales. And the results are pretty much same, similar, but uh, as you can see, the uh, as you can see, the uh, potential sites are much closer to the roads, which essentially is what the biosales do. And as the research, yeah, uh, I handle the roads. Yeah, so um, the results for our analysis, we put this into a web map that we made an experience builder. Um, so you can go up, you go on your site, you can open up and play around with that. It's just showing the suitable areas, um, the trees are in there, as well as the, the flow accumulation. Um, and as well, we have a, a 3D section where we show the, the LIDAR classified point clouds in 3D, and then everything in green is the, that's the, uh, the trees that were classified. And that concludes our presentation on the suitability of green water infrastructure in the town of Coburg. Uh, if you have any questions, we can entertain them now. So everything was done on um, the, yeah, with using ESRI products. Um, conveniently, ESRI has developed deep learning packages for us to use. Um, the MCDA was also done on Esri. The website was done through Experience Builder, which is also through XJS Online, which is also an Esri product. Um, with regards to LiDAR manipulation, we had to use two separate deep learning packages. One was for the trees, but the trees um, deep learning package was a little bit too aggressive. It identified power lines and sides of buildings as um, tree cover when it's not. And we had to use a separate deep learning package to at least kind of work around the power lines. So we had to run two separate ones. And um, because this uh, this process was very um, hardware intensive, it took um, like 45 minutes for the trees. It took four hours for the for the power lines to get classified. And that's just on like seven tiles, last tile. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jonathan will send you a, a PowerPoint. Yeah, we'll send the PowerPoint for sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that's time. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.
How's it going, everyone? Uh, my name is uh, Josh Mariche, and this is Justin. Um, we are just about to share our screen here and make sure that everybody can see that. Just make sure that everybody can see that screen. Okay, perfect. Um, again, so yeah, my name is Josh. This is Justin. Our project was specific to uh, Rondo Park, a member of the MECP, and we were doing utility mapping uh, in that park. All right, so yeah, our client was the Ministry of Environment, Conservation, and Parks, and uh, also known as the MECP. And basically, they had an outdated uh, utility tracking uh, system. And yeah, we received uh, you know, substantial support from the uh, MECP team. So a little bit about Rondo Provincial Park. It's in the south, it's in the southwest Ontario. Uh, it's a sand spit in Lake Erie. And it was established in 1894 and is the second oldest uh, provincial park in Canada. So basically the problem was they had concerns regarding their utility data. Um, pretty much all the data they had for all their utilities within the park was paper maps and sketches like you can see in the presentation. Uh, no digital work was completed. And uh, yeah, there's definitely potential to misinterpret these maps and sketches. So basically we went to Rondo Provincial Park for three days and we spent two nights there, uh, utilized uh, field maps and we collected uh, all service utility data at Rondo Provincial Park and uh, later adjusted and cleaned up the data. And this chart just breaks down the variety of uh, layers that were collected, almost 500 point lines of polygons across um, all those different uh, layers, you can see 16 different utility layers. Um, so the way we got the underground utility networks was from georeference maps that we had sent uh, the maintenance team. So after the data collection occurred, we made maps you know, showing all the surface data for um, certain networks. This is this example is for water. They sent us back um, a high level of detail, and we were able to then digitize those maps and get the locations of the underground utility networks. Um, some of the challenges that we experienced while we were down at the park um, were specific to our initial design with field maps. When we were down there at the time, we weren't entirely sure about uh, the needs that the maintenance team needed um, actually documented. So when we tried to copy layers, they ended up creating duplicates. We had point layers that were overlapping, um, which created some problems and, and the need for uh, a little bit of data cleanup. Um, on top of that, definitely uh, the hand-drawn sketches were a little bit challenging to meet together to see where we were actually working. Um, and last but not least, there was an, an, a bit of an accuracy issue for the purpose of the project. It's still uh, it was still good for us, but for future future use, that yeah, would be good to have a little bit better accuracy for some of that uh, collection data collection. Through that initial issue that we had um, with the field maps design, it kind of pushed us to make sure that we had a design that was sort of foolproof for uh, field maps and the park to use. So we actually went through, we talked with the maintenance team, found everything out, we created this new field map design um, that has unique identifiers for every feature. It's got uh, space for notes and almost everything that we could think of for those individual layers uh, was added in there. And uh, this is just an example of sort of that field map setup. Um, really nice, easy to use, highly recommended for uh, for future use as well. Through that, we also created some maps for the actual maintenance staff. We did this one uh, creative um, overview map, as Justin said, the park was created in 1894. So just to give it that old feel, we wanted to make sure that we could capture that somewhere older, that old style design. From there, we took uh, those points that we collected and those geo-referenced uh, lines that the park staff gave back to us. And we created three different maps. This is an example of the electrical grid um, specific to them. And these maps are in 11 by 17. So the park staff can actually print them and use them themselves and work through that as well. From there, we also created a new base map, put that online for a web map so that uh, it was a little bit user, more user friendly than the actual paper maps. So for other park staff and members of the MECP who aren't 
directly at the park and have access to those paper maps, they can still review all of this information through the web map platform um, and maneuver through there. Okay, so understanding risk. So we also performed a risk analysis on the um, underground utility networks for water and wastewater. And this assessment followed the framework from the American Water Works Association. And there's an example of the water utility risk analysis where the higher risk uh, locations are symbolized with a darker red to low risk and uh, represented as a yellow. And uh, we do have a little bit of time here for questions. If anybody's got any questions that they would like to ask, uh, we'll stop sharing the screen and uh, we'll see if there's anything in here. If not, we'll be good to go. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. Do they use solar? Um, I don't believe so. No, no. Most of their stuff is still uh, connected to the actual municipality um, in terms of the electrical network. Uh, that would be an interesting one. There is a lot of good sunlight there um, as well. But yeah, no, not at this time. So that was actually a bit of a mix. We, we initially went in with the intent of using field maps. And uh, luckily we prepared ahead because half the park actually doesn't have cell service. And because of the time we were just using our, our handheld devices, um, what ended up happening after that, um, without the cell service, we ended up using the GPS. Um, so it kind of worked both ways. We just did a GPX to features um, set up and process that data through yeah. that way. But yeah, um, field maps was able to, we were able to start creating that geodatabase while we were collecting points in the field. And the clients uh, was really pushing to use field maps. So, um, yeah, it was, it was definitely a good choice that over here just did a GPS. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Take care. Hello. So, we just get right into it, right? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our project. We are the Peterborough Return of Infrastructure. My name is uh, Andy Bell. Here are my colleagues. Uh, I'm Alex Willett. I'm an application specialist. And I'm Victoria Zakhar. I'm a cartography specialist. So to introduce our project, we're looking at the infrastructure in Peterborough. And of course, uh, infrastructure plays an integral role in the city's social uh, and economic development. Is it sharing now? Oh, sure, sure. Sure. Okay, sorry about that. So we start we start that then? just to restart. Okay, so go back? Should we go back? No, no, it's fine. Okay, true. So we're looking at infrastructure in Peterborough, and infrastructure plays an integral role in the city's deep and economic development. There are many services like roads, transportation, sewage that are crucial for a functioning city. So uh, now in, in many cities in Canada, the property tax contributes to different parts of the city, city's maintenance. Now, what if a city isn't generating enough tax to maintain uh, its infrastructure plans? And this brings me to my, our problem statement. So right now, there's no uh, definitive way for Peterborough to analyze their uh, financial impact of infrastructure. So we looked at uh, analyzing two aspects of their infrastructure, which included the snowplow cost and the sanitary and sewage cost. Now, our project goals were to gain a comprehensive understanding of the financial implications of these infrastructures. And we worked to develop a script that automates the entire spatial analysis. And we also presented these findings through user-friendly applications such as dashboards. So this is a result of our snowplow dashboard. Uh, we chose a light pink color with a little bit of transparency to display the polygons because that's the color that a lot of municipalities use just as a context to the roads, which um, zoomed out, you would notice that um, the roads use visual hierarchy. So the darker roads are, or the bigger roads like highways and the lighter roads, thinner roads are more like the local roads. And we also included a list on the left-hand side to when you zoom in and out, it shows the road segments. It shows the type of road segment it is, so local collector. It also shows the cost, the snowplow cost. And at the very bottom left side, it shows it is a total snowplow cost indicator. So based on when you zoom in and out, it shows the total sum of all the road segments. 
uh, to total some of the costs of all the road segments. And you're also able to click on any road segment within and see the total snow plow cost. Uh, so this is the storm and sanitary suits sewage line dashboard that we made. Um, so essentially through a series of different analysis, this is the output. Um, and so uh, again, it's interactive. Uh, you click on any of these points and it will show you the tax to how much uh, each property is contributing towards their segment of uh, the sewage line and then how much Peterborough uh, is contributing towards maintaining that annually. Um, and so again, it's interactive. Uh, you can click on properties and you can see uh, how much each is uh, contributing. Uh, so we also did cartographic output. Uh, so this is another style of it. Uh, this shows the entire network. It shows uh, both, again, sanitary and storm. Um, and it gives a great outline of just the entire network uh, that we're working with and the extensiveness of this. So the great about the thing about this project is only accounts for the sewage and snow removal infrastructure cost, which is a small portion of the overall infrastructure cost. In the future, a lot more components could be included, such as transit services, road repairs, and even salting costs for the snow plows. Um, more infrastructure would provide a more complete picture on the city's net gain and loss and provide decision makers more data to make big time decisions to ensure long term success of Peterborough's infrastructure. Thank you for listening to our presentation. We look forward to your questions. How does the dashboard oh. integrate with asset management, operational, and maintenance systems like CityWorks and IBM Maximo? Um, so working in CityWorks. Do you think you could? Uh, Maybe elaborate. Elaborate a bit, yeah. So, I mean, in this specific case, we're working with sewage. Um, there are, there is a lot of ability to expand with this sort of analysis. Like we said, that we we feel that um, in the future, different aspects and different portions of different asset management can be incorporated in this. Even with the the snow network. Uh, the snow plow network that we did. This is just a network of streets. And so we can pull different aspects into this, maybe um, such as like bus routes or uh, other things that cities maintain. Um, and so, yeah, we can we can incorporate this in different aspects. Can you see? It's a little more time picture. Definitely a possibility. We haven't. Personally, in the scope of our project, we did not uh, discover digital twins. It's still a pretty new concept in the GIS world, but absolutely, I think it definitely could be used in digital twins for sure. I'm building this project. That's, <laughs> yeah. um, that's a question that we could honestly ask our client too. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah, I yes. It does want to build this with our future recommendations, like I, I believe there's so much more you can do with the project. Because like like Alex mentioned, we only like we only looked at a small fraction of infrastructure. So I think it is uh, it would be crucial, you know, like to, to build upon this so the city can continue uh, managing its uh, infrastructure costs mm -hmm. yeah, so definitely. yeah so for sure it's it's something that the client would want to build upon. this is just the base like you can go much more complex much it feels deeper like we only that. scratch the surface oh absolutely yeah, yeah. if you yeah i mean we looked at snow and sewage there's so many other types of infrastructure right even like i said salting costs yeah. with we even snow. accommodate for salting for snow and that, that, that could factor it as a cost yeah. as well mm -hmm. Unlimited. Yeah, there's, there's <laughs> as long as the city has infrastructure, yep. we can analyze it. Absolutely. What do you mean by you elaborate, LA? Jonathan? Our costs were pretty linear, so we didn't have a lot of different factors going into it. Um, we took but, below, or this is stormwater. Yeah, we took below water or below infrastructure. We didn't do any surface infrastructure as well. Uh, I think that will probably wrap it up now because I know we're the last group. But. Well, thank All right, you thanks for, for listening, the everyone. Hi, everyone. 
I'm just going to share my screen here. This is Kendra Chalmers again. Um, I'm just a professor here at Fleming. Are you on? I did. There you go. Um, thank you all for um, coming to watch all those presentations. Uh, we really appreciate all the involvement and the great questions. Um, I want to point you in the direction. I am sharing my screen, aren't I? Here we go. Um, I want to point you all in the direction of our um, open source portal here. So if you do want to continue to explore any of our projects, you can do so here um, by clicking on any of the projects that you may have missed or maybe found particularly interesting. You can click on them. Everyone should have their own little team website where you can get much more information about any given project. Um, some of our teams will still have a little additional um, sort of personal group WebEx room that you can jump into. So you can see that some of our teams are featured live still and they'll be live until 2 p.m. today. So if you want to go chat with any of our online students, you can do that and get some very specific demos, maybe ask for some more specific questions and get some interesting answers. Um, and there you go. This website should be active for uh, a little while longer. You can probably see this in, the, in many days, maybe even up to a week after our open house. Um, so if you want to go refer back to this at any point, it should be up for a little while. Um, I should say too that if you want to get in touch with any of our students, their names are listed here. But also, if you go to their team website, most of them have included um, their, sort of their preferred contact information that way. Okay, and that's it. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, helping celebrate all of our students' hard work. Thanks.